genre. In the world of Hollywood, movies get greenlit and redlit. They get remade and rebooted. But we are the ideal. I'm Sam Gash, and you are listening to Ideal Remake. Thank you for listening to Ideal Remake. We take movies that either have been, will be, or should be remade and talk about what the ideal version of that remake would be. Today, we're talking about an animated movie that decided that the best way for the villains to overcome and demoralize the heroes was to show actual footage of Hitler talking. In its animated movie. So, (laughs) Jay Coulahan is Wizards. A movie that has been, will be, or should be remade. Should be. Absolutely. For for many, many reasons that I'm sure we'll get into. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so first things first, Jake, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. How, how did you first hear of the movie Wizards? So, <laughs> um, growing up, I was the kind of person that... I didn't really go out. I just spent a lot of my time doing like going down Wikipedia rabbit holes on like films and all this stuff. So I would investigate film history and all this stuff. And at some point I started finding this guy, Ralph uh, Bakshi, Bashki. I I never know how to (laughs) pronounce his name. And then somewhere in the filmography, it was Wizards. And out of all the stuff he's made, I read the idea for that. And I was like, wow, that sounds like a great idea for a movie. I'll have to give that a watch. (laughs) <laughs> about an hour and 25 late 25 minutes later i think that might be one of the first big like disappointments of like growing up as a film watcher going oh some movies are uh not gonna be the way you want them to be <laughs> yeah it's always sad when you have that memory of a child as a child of like watching a movie and realizing in your head sometimes these aren't good oh yeah Um, Oh, no. And I feel like, you know, usually when that happens, like when I was a kid, that would happen. It would just be like, oh, I didn't find it funny. Like the Mike Myers cat in the hat. It's like, this isn't Dr. Seuss. Wizards is on a completely different level of insanity. (laughs) It's, yeah, it, you know what? Let's put that aside. What I realize I'm skipping is, hey, People listening don't know who you are. So before we get into that insanity and before we start really getting into, hey, this movie's something, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the sort of person who might have uh, (laughs) jumped down a rabbit hole and found wizards. Yeah. um, I'm sure like a lot of folks that have been on this podcast, I was born and raised on movies. You know, I'm an aspiring writer. Mm -hmm. I'm out here in Burbank. Yeah, I usually tend to focus on a lot of um, genre stuff, usually horror or sci-fi with comedic elements. Good. Yep. Top-notch stuff. <laughs> God, this part, these parts are always hard because it's like the second someone asks you that, it's like your brain just decides to wipe itself at this moment. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting. Like, I, I was seeing you sitting there with the black shirt with the pink writing, and I was this close to wearing a black shirt with pink writing on it uh, today. <gasps> That just said genre blast because <laughs> I went and submitted like I had a script that won genre blast a few years ago, a script that I co-wrote uh, an animated script. I co-wrote with my friend Diane Bloom, who's been a guest on this show before black short, pink writing and like gnarled text because genre is the best. Oh yeah. I love genre. Absolutely. I think it's got, it. it's the perfect balance to me of human feelings and real philosophical ideas but also, like, you can have robots and aliens and go insane with it and, you know, go crazy while still having that deeper human connection, which is something that, I guess, to, to ease into the movie a little bit, I think is something this movie lacks, <laughs> among many other things. Yeah, like, I think that this was a good movie for both of us to talk about because we clearly love the escapism that movies can provide sometimes of just like a whole other world and just like getting to learn the weird nuances of that world is in and of itself almost as interesting sometimes as whatever story they're trying to tell us in that world. Like what are the rules? How does it work? What is the magic system? What is this? What is that? Ooh, what does that do? Who designed this? Like all of that's so cool and fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then also this adventure is happening in this case, the wizard avatar 
has to recruit some people to kill his brother Black Wolf. Yeah, at its as yeah, one does. At its core, it's like a classic quest film, you know? Yeah. Well, on paper. <laughs> and it's also I, I am also a big fan of writing stories about I, I guess for lack of a better term, tribal conflicts, you know, like two groups of people that have to do their best to get along or die trying. And I think that's something that I see a lot in this movie too, is you know, again, it's it's that thing of Right from the beginning, it says an illuminating history bearing on the everlasting struggle for world supremacy fought between the powers of technology and magic. And I don't know, the second I first saw that the first time I was like, oh, I'm in. You know, it's like, I almost think of it as like when you go to Disneyland and they have that big plaque up top that's like, here you leave today and into the worlds of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy. I love stuff like that, that those like mission statements of like, this is what it is. This is what you're going to get. Now let's go. Yeah, ah, it's the best. And that is why a movie called Wizards should be just like a slam dunk, but in uh, magical terms. Yes. Yeah. Just a real nat 20. Oh, there, there we, we go. go. Yeah, perfect. That's <laughs> like an idea like this. You know, I get that it's from, I think it's 77. Yeah, and something like that. I understand the idea that, like, at that time, a lot of the kind of fantasy film that was coming out was, like, less Lord of the Rings, more Conan the Barbarian, you know, like, more sword and sorcery than, like, Tolkien. And I think it's great that this movie decides to do none of that and instead go, what if we just do nothing? <laughs> well, I also, like, on paper, love the idea of blending magic and science fiction in that, depending on your belief system and what you've worked on, some beings are creatures of magic and some beings are creatures of technology. And having those two things come into direct conflict of each other with each other as like one is about cooperation with the natural uh, environment and one is about exploiting the natural environment potentially. And like going back and forth between the two is inherently like a, a rich a rich uh, vein to mine for for like good story and compelling tribal yeah, conflict. It, it's you know you say that, and I immediately think of something like Princess Mononoke, where it's literally that's that's the core conflict yeah. is exploiting the natural world versus living in in ex co like peace with it, and I guess in a in a way sort of being not necessarily subservient, but I can't think of a better word. And the idea is like, is there a middle ground there? Is there the compromise is there in a way that both of these people can work among themselves and find a greater good, you know? And yeah. something that I, I saw a lot in this was the idea too of like taking from the old ways while also learning from the new, you know, something that I think a movie like, like the last Jedi, I think explores and I think has a lot of potential, you know? Yeah. So, I suppose we should actually talk about wizards. Yeah, I guess before we get to the fun part, we have to actually talk about the original movie. Yeah. The the movie as it exists is not particularly dense. The The movie starts with the worst voiceover I've ever heard. It's, I think the whoever they got, I think, is fine for like a fantasy type narrator. I just don't know why they decided the like the director decided to give her a bunch of Ambien before they started recording. <laughs> yeah, like her vo she has a lovely voice, but it sounds like she's bored, falling asleep or yeah, on opium. Yeah, it's it's nuts and you know, to be fair, I do think it's an indicator early on of like you hear that voice and it starts to go in you and you go, "Oh no, something's off here." Yeah. That is not a voice that would say, you know, Yeah, words. it's definitely not something that, like, it's not Kate Blanchett at the beginning of Fellowship of the Ring, like, catching you up to speed where it's like, right. ooh, I'm, 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 I'm interested, I'm hooked. It's just, you know, it's mm -hmm. like listening to someone, like, in your English class in eighth grade read aloud from, like, Of Mice and Men, and, like, they're just, they're reading it very slowly, word by word, and just, you're trying not to, to nod off. And- Theoretically, she's telling us about something interesting. She says, hey, so pretty much humanity was wiped out by five terrorists. They managed to pretty much ir irradiate the entire world and humanity mm -hmm. pretty much and died. We're not going to talk about that, though. That doesn't yeah. matter to us today. Um, like, yeah, 
we're millions and millions of years yes, it's after very that. mad max in the fact of like okay this happened we're not going to get into the details just this happened moving on get into the the rest of it yeah um which is just the idea that and this is already the first thing that i love is the idea that fantasy creatures a exist in our real world and b they were basically just right. hibernating until i don't know why they're hibernating was there a prophecy did they just see humans coming oh. and go you know i i i took that differently i was like this is millions and millions of years hence and they and a lot of times in the movie they refer to themselves as human and so this is what humanity looks like after the millions and millions of years. Like this is what has emerged and remains. Oh. And they have become the fairies and the dwarves oh, and the I, Okay. Interesting. Cause I I that was my interpretation. Like what humans were left were turned into like mutants and like very orc like like yeah. orcs in the Mad Max universe kind of vibe. And then, you know, fairies and elves and wizards and all this stuff like they were like deep underground <laughs> and that when the, the, when the bombs so, finally fell and like the air was safe and clean, then they came back out and go, ah, oh, the earth is ours once again. Yeah. Well, so like I interpreted it as that also, but I interpreted it that they were humans and some humans like found and embraced magic and became these magical creatures and like the others were left in the radiation and became mutants. And some were these frog mutants and lizard mm -hmm. mutants and, like, Black Wolf got a bunch of frog mutants together, and that was his army. But, like, they were in very much a, a time machine, like yeah, a, an H.G. Yeah. Wells of way in the future. We have the ones who are like, oh, the, what were they, the Vartis and the and the Morlocks? I, I always remember the Futurama parody where it's, like, the Dum Dums and the Big Brains or something like that, where it's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is that that is kind of how they're treating it of like it's it, like humanity has split so much so that we meet the like this one fairy queen gives birth mm -hmm. to twins one who is a uh, just a cool guy just neat just hanging out just yeah, being a, like being a chill bro uh -huh. and the other one his arms are skeletons and he's an evil I, monster I, I love him. how yeah she just like for some reason her her family genetics are like there's like a 50% chance of like Keebler elf baby. And then there's 50% chance of like yep. bearded hippie Skeletor. <laughs> yeah. Who like, he looks human except that his arms have no flesh or muscles. They're just bones, but they and, still and work fine. And of course fine. they're like cartoon, like skeleton dance, like play it like a xylophone bones. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. And so immediately, like, the dude who's got, like, the shunned arms bones, like, he's like, oh, we hate him. And he goes off and lives in a cave. And the other guy's like, we're going to teach him all the magic because he's a wonderful, uh, precious baby. So, like, that's why I was like, okay, they're all kind of the same species, just, like, died, changed evolutionary paths of the yeah. radiation. Or and uh, I have to mention, too, this feels like such a very weird and specific detail, like, Avatar, who is the good brother, he gets raised by by the mother, yep. you know, who's who she's she's ill and she's dying, but she gets taught magic. Meanwhile, Black Wolf, like, they give him like this serial killer backstory, like he goes out in the woods and like kills squirrels, which is just like, <laughs> yeah, it's like man, setting set him up for success <laughs> from from an early age. Yeah, it's. It, he's he absolutely serial kid. Like once he was was wasn't satisfied with birds anymore, he moved on to squirrels. And once he wasn't satisfied with squirrels anymore, he moved on. Yeah, it's to so people. it's so bizarre. Yeah, and then from there, it's like he Black Wolf kind of retreats and creates his own society. And then like um, him and Avatar, once the mother dies, they have this great battle. You know, which of course we don't see. It's only described because we're just fast forwarding. Yeah, of course. Why would we Why want would to see we? the the big epic battle of two brothers on opposite sides, like torn apart? This is a spoiler for later in the movie, but we don't even see a big epic battle then either. <laughs> we certainly do not. Which oh, we'll get there. But yeah, then the battle happens. Set it and like Black Wolf loses, and it's very like, mm, till next time we meet again. <laughs> and then it is exactly that. Yeah, and then hard cut. What was it three thousand years later? Three thousand years later, which is insane. 
And Avatar, and, oh, uh, uh-huh. yeah, over the course of that 3,000 years, Black Wolves tried again and lost. And Black Wolves tried again and lost to the point where it's a joke. And all the little good guys are like, ha, 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 those monsters will come and attack us and we'll slaughter them to pieces and then they'll run away. Yeah, it's very Saturday morning cartoon-like. Tune in, same same time, same channel. Yeah, next... watch Rambo explode these guys. Yeah, and then from there we see modern day Avatar, who's very... He gives off some, like, Big Lebowski vibes to me. Oh, I was thinking he was giving off... Well, Big Lebowski meets Garden Gnome. Yes, yes. Where he's, he just seems very, like... I don't know, he's he's one white Russian away <laughs> from being the exact same character, to me anyway. <laughs> You know who he also reminds me of? It's the Mel Brooks character, the 3,000-year-old man. <laughs> eh, why would I give a... Why should I try? All right, it's been enough already. And it's just this side of a uh, stereotype. Yeah, a little bit, which, you know, as as you'll come to learn, is very much Ralph Basky, Bakshi's, like... That's part of his oeuvre, <laughs> you know. Is... It, yeah, uh, apparently he's all about racial stereotypes. <laughs> Yeah, he, again, this is a director who very much from comes in the 60s and 70s. Like, this is the guy who did a movie like Fritz the Cat, which is just, I've never even seen it. All I know is, is that it's an X-rated animated movie. It's just like a night on the town kind of thing. Like, lots of sex, violence, swearing, the occasional slur, you know, because he's, what a classy guy. Yeah. and he And he brings that energy to this, which... Is definitely creates an interesting combination. One that I would say very firmly does not work. No, 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 no. Because, like, in the same way we talked about that the voiceover actress was uh, on Ambien, none of the vocal performances are good. Mm -hmm. And so, basically, the premise of this is that Black Wolf is like, I have tried over and over again to conquer the good guys because I want to rule the entire world, not just my irradiated part. And... He's been promising his people, Scar-like, that soon we'll have the good land, and that's why they should stick with me, that you'll never go hungry again. Very Disney villain, yeah. And he's like, I finally did it. I have been excavating the the remains from millions of years ago. I have been finding the artifacts and everything because I'm obsessed with humanity, and I want to replicate the glory that they were. Didn't they kill themselves? Yes, and it's beautiful. And... Like, that's what he's leaning into. And so finally, he finds this old projector (sighs) and he finds film reel. Keeping in mind, how long does film last? 10, 15 years total? Yeah, the the uh, the fact that it didn't disintegrate at all. It's it's pretty, pretty crystal clear is uh, nothing short of a miracle. Magical. Magical. Oh, there we go. There we go. Maybe magic's good for something after all in his sake. (laughs) Well, let's wait for the next sentence I'm about (laughs) to say. (laughs) and so basically he finds this film reel and he's like this is it this is the thing that's going to demoralize and defeat the good guys and i said it at the beginning it is literally just in this animated movie footage of hitler talking right and not even like animated recreations or like rotoscoped it's just straight up like the actual propaganda footage that like the nazis made during world war ii yes it is genuinely just hey hitler's in this movie yeah i I, which would lead me to believe that hitler's got to have an imdb credit because like this movie's (laughs) on imdb oh my god but like oh my god it's ridiculous so like and the thing is that like oh all his little like monsters and demons and orcs are like yeah this is gonna work they're gonna hate it (laughs) Uh, yeah And then, so, like, they go and attack, and the projector, like, projects onto the battlefield however many thousands of miles away. And the good guys see it, and they just, like, all the, like, hope drains from them. They drop their weapons. And then the bad guys just come along and just stab them all, just, like, going down the line, stabbing all these good guys. Because, fuck it, they're, like, they can't do anything. Hitler's talking. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, it's it's insane. Like, and, and... The the amount of, of Nazi iconography, like, it gets to a point where, like, the army start wearing armbands with swastikas. Yeah. And it's like, what are we doing? The army starts referring to Black Wolf as their fear. Yes. And it's just like, like, I get the point that the movie is saying of, like, this is bad. It's a very bad thing he's doing. He's very much a villain. 
I don't think we need it to go that far. It really gives off the energy of the 70s, like, transgressive, like, ooh, we're doing this because people yeah. will like it. Ugh. And it's like, it's really unnecessary. Yeah. Like, his office does not need to be swastika-shaped, but it is. Yep. It's it's really so, distasteful. in the middle of all that... Yeah. Yeah, in the middle of all that, he's like, the one person who'd be able to stop me is my brother Avatar. So I'm going to send these mercenaries. The, they, there's a word for them, but I don't specifically remember what it was. I don't I don't remember either. I think at one point they even get referred to as stormtroopers, which... Oh, very yeah, funny. that's true. Um, but like, yeah, so the, the mercenaries get sent out to like track down and kill Avatar. And so like, they're like making their way and specifically they're tasked with anyone who is a magical creature or uses magic, kill them. And so we get to have, like, a few minutes of them just these, like, weird-looking... Like, if you look up Wizards and you look at the, like, poster, the character that you see is one of these uh, these mercenaries. And Yeah, I think it's his, like, top top guy, right? It's his top guy who, yeah, until in a little bit, is mostly nameless. But it looks like his, like... Yeah. He looks like a Dr. Seuss character. He, he looks like Dr. Seuss was tasked with doing the concept art for Star Wars. Yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. That's a perfect yeah. description. Which I, I feel like that that poster, just by describing it like that, does a bit major disservice to the movie because that sounds awesome. Yeah. Theoretically. I've I'd seen the poster before. Like when you suggested the the movie, I looked up the poster. I was like, oh, I have seen this poster before. Like this is iconic enough that I'm like, oh, I recognize the poster. That's pretty good. Oh, yeah. yeah. And like I, the episode that came out before this one is Popeye, and like I'm familiar with Popeye, but I'd never seen the poster before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wizards. It feels like one of those things, and maybe I say this because this happened to me, and I'm just like, I don't remember it all that well. It feels like something you walked by at a blockbuster or something, yeah. and we're just like, ooh, that looks neat, and then you just kept moving because you didn't know anything about it. Or as I'm sure happened to some people. It's an animated movie, so parents are like, this is a cartoon. It'll be fine for my kids. Oh, yeah. No, it's a great double feature. Wizards and then Deadpool and Wolverine. Yeah. Fun for the whole family. Everyone's having a time. Yeah. So basically, the, the, these robotic mercenaries make their way across the land, and the Native American stand-in named Weehawk and his partner are like, nah, I feel like we should re take a rest. No, there's mercenaries everywhere. Fine. Two steps forward. Oh, no, a mercenary. And Bam. so they're getting tracked down. Weehawk's companion gets taken out. Weehawk's weird horse thing gets taken out. And Weehawk is pretty much let, leaves himself exposed as he's praying over his dead horse as opposed to continuing or hiding. And the mercenary sneaks up on him. But then Weehawk mm -hmm. sees him coming. Anytime Weehawk's about to do battle, instead of being stealthy, he screams at the top of his lungs and then goes in gun swords blazing. And I don't think he wins a battle the entire movie, but that's not... No, that's no. separate. I, in fact, I think the first time we see him in battle, I laughed out loud because no strategy, no nothing. He pulls like an Obi Wan in Revenge of the Sith and just like jumps into the center of the danger and just announces himself and just goes to like goes and starts attacking this guy and they both fall off a cliff. Yeah, and so then we cut to. I want to say he's the king, but his name is President. Yeah, I. I don't understand, and this is something we'll get into with the ideas, but there's really no sense of, like, the societal structure here, which, yeah. again, there is kind of an overall vibe of, like, in this movie, magic equals law and order and technology and Black Wolf's armies is chaos and, and violence and, and, and anger and war. But then for all of that, there's really no sense of, like... The president, who is wearing, like, a weird clown mask, like a cheapo that dollar store clown. so weird. Yeah, and it seems like he's mostly just, like, a puppet for Avatar, who's really the ruler. But yet, it seems like he just has the title of president, so people are like, oh, well, we need a leader, even though he doesn't do anything. But then they refer to the daughter, Eleanor, as the princess, and when president is killed, she is the queen. So it's like, I, it feels like his name is president. Yeah, but he which, is it, his name is so he's got to be like King President <laughs> while I he's mean, wearing I, his like uh, what's the name of the, the killer from Saw? Oh, like his weird jigsaw mask. Yeah, he's wearing a jigsaw mask. Yeah, it's it's very weird. He's got that in a top hat and like I don't I never rename, remember the name of the suit coats, but it's the one the conductors wear with the little tails on the back. Yeah, you know, it's just very like it's certainly a look. 
Yeah. Uh, not necessarily and, a good one, but it's a look. Yeah. And so basically, like, Avatar is like, I'm 3,000 years old. I'm not going to deal with it. Let the armies deal with it. They always, it's fine. And then the the uh, the assassin, oh, they're just called assassins. That's it. The assassin think, shows up. I think his name in the movie, which they don't really establish, I, I think I only know about it because, you know, look doing research for this, looking at the Wiccan stuff, I think his name initially is Necron. Oh, I think you're right. But they never, I don't think they ever really talk about that because, again, this movie doesn't care about story. Black Wolf at the beginning is like, and his name is Black Wolf. Again, oh, he's evil? Black. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I think it's like Necron, my most trusted assassin. Go get him. The assassin gets there, kills King President, and then Avatar is able to kind of like shut him down. And then Weehawk shows up and is like, I didn't get here in time. Oh no. It almost yeah. feels like it should have been a comedy beat of like, Avatar, Mr. President, quick, there's a Oh shit. <laughs> yeah, kind of. It feels like that's kind of what the idea was. It feels like that, but then they don't do the like the the comedy beats. He just shows up, and it's supposed to be a big dramatic scene because yeah. I think Ele like Eleanor was is his daughter, and like, and also she's half fairy, which they just kind of establish in passing, and like as far as I remember, doesn't really ever come up for most of the movie. It, for the first chunk of the movie, it's Avatar's training me in magic so that I can become a full fairy. But yeah. we never see that, and mm -hmm. it sure seems to be implied that training me in magic means having sex with a teenager. Yep, and again, going off of this director's usual work, that that goes perfectly in line with, with the kind of stuff he normally makes, which yeah. is just weird and bizarre and tasteless. So now the, the king is dead, and... the but. And Black Wolf has this incredible thing. And so they need to go and take out Black Wolf, take out this technology, avenge the king. And so Avatar, Eleanor, Weehawk. And Avatar has fixed up the assassin, which it turns out is a robot. And he's named the robot Peace. And he's Very going subtle. To, so subtle. And they're going <laughs> to use this robot to guide them back to Black Wolf. Now, Eleanor and Weehawk do not trust the robot, and they're like, well, that sucks. Mm -hmm. And Avatar's like, it's going to be fine, though. And they go, okay. So they go off, and the first thing that happens is they get to a forest, and Peace says, we shouldn't go in there. That's dangerous. Let's go around. And everyone says, you're stupid. We're going in. Turns out that forest is dangerous. There Shocker. are, Yeah, turns out there are fairies who live in the forest, and they are tricksy fairies who love mischief and chaos, and they're like twist the world around the good guys yeah. until finally like the good the quote unquote good guys are captured and we meet Sean. Sean, who I, I do want to point out, I think this is interesting, is played by Mark Hamill. And this is What? I, yes, this movie came out the same year as Star Wars Episode Four. I want to oh say God. before. And it's Mark Hamill's like technically it's his first theatrical role. I think he filmed Star Wars before this, but this came out first. So this is technically like his feature film debut. What a legacy. What the fuck? Yeah. Oh my God, Sean. Sean, King of the Fairies. Yeah, hi, I'm King of the Fairies. We'd be happy to help you. Oh no, some bad guys are here and they've killed Sean. Welp, it was nice meeting you, Sean. Yeah, he's in it for all of five seconds. And the other thing I don't get is there's a, a huge chunk after this where it's like the fairy kingdom is like, Avatar did it, Avatar did it. Even though how many fairies are there that witnessed the assassination go down? Like, yeah, Avatar's just sitting there like hanging out like, oh, hey, guys. Like, I don't get this. It's so pointless. Like, it goes into yeah. like, they take they take Avatar and like, we're going to kill you. And he's like, OK, do it because I didn't do anything. And they go, you were going to let us kill you. Oh, you know what? You're all right. Like, we've changed <laughs> our minds. Bye. Yeah. And they like have Eleanor tied up and like do the whole like constrain the uh, attractive woman in the skimpy outfit while she like strains against her by bonds Ugh, or whatever. Yeah. A again for she's, she is, she is like half fairy. There's the, the kind of sort of not really build up, but it's there that like she has a power because she's like half fairy, half human, you know, that like, 
there's great potential in her. It never happens. She's just nope. there because Ralph Bakshi wanted to draw someone wearing like the loosest outfit I have ever <laughs> seen on a character for yeah. no reason. Yeah. And it, I imagine it was hard for him to be animating this movie one handed, but by God, he did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of that's true. So then they managed to get away and then Weehawk and Peace the Robot go on an adventure that we don't see. And Eleanor and Avatar walk through a frozen tundra and get sad for a while. And then when all hope is lost, they've given up. They resign themselves to death. Peace and Weehawk show up. And it's like, it's okay. We got you. Everything's going to be fine. So then they take three steps. A literal tank shows up because this movie is animated. But let, let us not forget that it's also lazy as fuck. They integrate like actual footage of a tank into the the thing because they do that all the time it's like oh hey here's the bad guys some drawings some like shittily filmed dudes it's it's very much a, a, a like part of the 70s wave of animation where it's a lot of these like aggro transgressive guys getting like five dollars in a can of spaghettios for their budget and going yeah well, make it work so they incorporate a lot of mixed media it's just like well, we can't. We don't have the money to animate the tank. Just like put some public, like some stock-free footage in there. We'll call it yeah. a day. So this tank shows up, opens the hatch. Eleanor stabs Peace and then gets in the tank. Gets in Peace, the, the tank. robot, deflates, is dead, does not come back. That's it. That's the end. That's the story of Peace. Yep. And then, and then she gets in the tank and goes. And it's like this whole big like and then Avatar's broken inside. He's a shell of a man because Eleanor's gone, but they have to continue on. Anyways, yeah. yeah. So they, they they continue their journey. Avatar's this broken wreck because he's like, My my surrogate daughter, like, I was kind of her father figure, you know, like but, Right. That's how I interpreted it as well. Yeah, yeah. And and then at that point, that's when they they finally arrive at, is it, I forget, again, I forget what Black Wolf City is called. I want to say it's like Kronos or like Kragor or something silly like that. I don't know. It's du- it's a dumb name that I also don't remember. Yeah. And they get to this town. It's like, oh, it's a shitty town. There's literally some like captured fairy who's like doing a dance for a bunch of like got like creepy like lizard dudes. And then the dance is over and they keep staring at her and she like slowly starts to strip and we cut away. And it's like, cool. Great. Thanks, guys. Yeah, there's there's all this like forced stripping. There's like goblin sex workers like. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's gross and bad. Yeah. They, they slowly make their way to the castle. But Avatar is the shell of a man, but he still has to face Black Wolf. And Weehawk goes and tries to, like, do something. And he runs into Eleanor. And he's like, Eleanor, how could you betray us? Avatar's broken. And she's like, I didn't know. I touched Peace, who was apparently in a constant struggle in his mind between Avatar and Black Wolf. But I wasn't as strong as that. And I was taken over and did a bad thing. Yes. The, oh, the, no. The, the magic user, the half fairy, who is trained by what legends say is the greatest wizard of all time, just, like bumped shoulders with the robot's like red outfit and then is suddenly like oh yeah i'm like a brainwashed nazi now okay bye and he's like yeah just helpless to it like ugh. so then we get and so then we cut back to the battle between black wolf and avatar and avatar is like all right we should have had this battle a long time ago it's enough i'm gonna roll up my sleeves Hey, Black Wolf, you left too early. You never knew this trick that mom taught. And Black Wolf's like, oh, yeah, what is that trick? And then Avatar's like, all right, it was this. Pulls out gun. Bang. Kills Black Wolf. End of big conflict. Avatar. Again, Avatar, who we've set up this whole movie, is the greatest wizard. They had a, they've had many great battles, you know? And someone who is so staunchly anti-technology. And it's like, oh, we're just giving up, like, what little dramatic heft there could have been. We're just giving it up for the sake of like, blah, blah. yeah, it's you've watched 90 to 95 percent of this movie. And then everyone who's in this movie turns, looks directly down the camera and says, fuck you, fuck you for watching this. Yeah. Like, oh, my God, it's it is it is the worst it's, type of subversion, which is like the like the director looking down the barrel of the lens and going neener, neener. <laughs> yeah, it it's awful. And then. So in the remaining two minutes of the movie, while we're getting our stupid voiceover lady back, I said stupid. Our stupor 
voiceover <laughs> lady back. We we cut back and it's like, all right, time to go back and rule the kingdom since you're the queen now. And and Eleanor's like, you know what? I don't want to rule the kingdom. We hawk, you can go rule the kingdom. I'm gonna go be with Avatar forever now. And it's like, what? Yeah, it turns out we're in love or something. Anyway, bye. We hawk's like, Avatar, you're cool with this. And he's like, look at her. Why wouldn't I be? Waka waka. End of <laughs> <What>? movie. <laughs> Sorry, the the uh, the the waka waka got me. It's. And it's so weird, too, because, again, the whole movie established, like, there's sort of a father-daughter, like, symbolic mentor-protege dynamic. Yeah. And then it's just like, I'm gonna go hit that in, like, the weird magical Evermore, like, land. See ya, chumps! I spent the whole movie being like, at least it's not that. But then it turns out it was that. Yeah, it's... I, I, I think the perfect way to summarize this whole thing was... I remember we had, we were talking and you had picked uh, or I had picked this movie and you had started watching it and the first thing I get from you I don't think you were even like halfway through halfway through and you were like man I got to tell you this movie is taking some swings <laughs> <laughs> I, none of them work but it's taking some swings it's 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 really up there batting a zero yeah it's which is a shame because I think you know, you look at it and it's, it's not Ralph Bakshi, Bak, Bakshi, Bakshi, <laughs> that director. He, he loves doing his like seventies, like hangout movies, just a lot of weird stuff, weird bits, weird characters. Right. But yeah. then this almost feels like, is this like a studio job where someone assigned him this like fantasies book to adapt and he just did something terrible with it? And as far as I'm aware, this is just more of the same for him in terms of how it got developed of just like, oh, I had this idea. And then what if this happens and this happens? Like he outlined it, but then he never went back and like filled in the details of like, okay, scene scene A goes to scene B goes to scene C. And there's no flow to it. It's just like things happen. There's weird images, some Nazi footage. Bang, boom, we're done. Like, get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, and like to think that he made Wizards and then the next year did The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, which is like another one of these. I think that one's far more coherent and I think follows, you know, the the Lord of the Rings series a, a lot more. It almost feels like this was like you know how the Game of Thrones creators were like, "Oh, we got we got a <laughs> Star Wars deal, so we just got to finish. Like hurry it up, hurry it up." What if yeah, it yeah, was yeah. that where it's like Oh, I'm get, I got Lord of the Rings. Like, okay, well, I just need to finish this movie. Uh, I don't know. He pulls out a gun. Bang, boom, shoot, they're dead. The the old like thousand year old man like hooks up with the fairy girl. Like the end. <laughs> okay, bye. I'm gonna go do Lord of the Rings now. See it, chumps. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's and apparently in 2004 there was a uh, some sort of 34 minute video retrospective about wizards but uh i'm not we're not gonna go into that yeah i think i think there have been some attempts on his behalf because ralph bakshi after the 90s and films like cool world which that one's a whole mess in and of itself but (laughs) if you look like after that there's like some minor attempts to like maybe continue the story do like some independent short films or like graphic novels as far as i'm aware it doesn't really go anywhere and even if it did if you've watched the movie, I really don't think anyone would be interested in reading it because I can't imagine someone watching this movie and going, man, I can't wait to hear more. <laughs> At least. <laughs> I mean, kind of. Yeah. What I'm learning in this moment is that he's still alive. Oh, yeah. He's still he's still kicking. I feel like every now and then you'll see him like, oh, I got another Kickstarter coming up and then it just doesn't really work out for him. Like, I well, you look at a picture of this guy and he's just like, oh, he just looks like a nice jovial old man. Oh, yeah. He I, he feels like the kind of person that, like, you know, he's like someone's nice grandpa, but if you start to talk to him, he's got some wild stories about his time in his 30s and the 70s. Like, stuff yeah. that, like, he would be telling his grandchildren that he should not be. <laughs> yeah, kind of. And so, like, I, you know, he's still, yeah, he's still alive, he's still kicking, he has independent stuff he does nowadays, but I feel like his time was really was the 70s and, like, early 80s, where more independent projects like this could get made and you could just kind of get away with making it nothing where it's just like, yeah. Oh, like, okay. Like some guy, like some executive at 20th century Fox, which love that. Eleanor's a Disney princess, you know, (laughs) a good one. Yeah. I don't know, but she's, she's a Disney Mm. princess now, 
I just imagine in the 70s, some like 20th century Fox guy chopping a cigar, cigar and getting a shoulder massage and going, hey, it looks fine enough. Like, show me the next five things we've got coming out in the next month. Like, just churn it out. Keep moving. You know. Get it in the theaters. It'll, it, we'll, we'll package it together with some of the other movies. They'll have to buy it. They gotta watch it. It's animated. Yeah, this seems like fodder that would be played at a drive-in for, like, teenagers to go make out and then occasionally look up and go, oh, the cartoon did a swear. <gasps> You know, uh, legitimately, yeah. yeah. It's that's that's really all it is. But that that's this PG rated movie. <laughs> I forgot. It's, oh, the days where a <laughs> film like this could get a PG. So let's talk about what we want to do with it. Like we've talked about our love of these kinds of worlds, but how do we make something that is technically a remake of Wizards while also is nothing like Wizards? Like, what did you have yeah. in mind? So I think my big thing here is. You look at a lot of, I, I think the foundation of it, the idea of the war between, or the relationship between magic and technology, like, that is such a common thing. You look at, like, Star Wars, Marvel, even something like Star Trek, you know, like, there are elements of that s- scattered throughout all these different successful franchises, and I think what you have here is a perfect opportunity for, like, a, how do I put this? It's, the ideas are weird. But you make them completely straight, super reverent, right? And like in old return to these like classic quest movies, you know, high fantasy, like the legends being retold. Like, I think this has the opportunity tonally to explore, again, have the kind of tribal conflicts of something like the newer apes movies, sort of the apocalyptic insanity of something like Mad Max And sort of the high fantasy of something like Lord of the Rings or like the original Star Wars trilogy all packaged into this bundle that I think would also make really, it would be really fun if it was animated because creatively, I think it's a great way to honor the legacy of someone who is considered sort of like one of the higher up kind of ranked animators in animation history. And business-wise, because no one would ever in like spend this kind of money on a live action adaptation of this. No, and nor nor should they. And I think this is the sort of thing where if you're going to be playing around with fantasy and science fiction, like that sounds like a fun cartoon. That sounds like Kipo in the Age of uh, of uh, Wonder Beasts or whatever it is. Or yeah, yeah, on the the, the yeah, or your yeah. owl houses or your amphibias of like I love those things and mm-hmm. they work well as animation because you can have these blends of like simple while like. They talked about how on F- when they were making Futurama of like, we want to have one thing every episode that is justification of why this needs to be animation of like, let's do mm. something in animation that wouldn't work in live action. And I understand that we can do like CG and like all those different things in movies now, but like, let's have a movie. Let's have a cartoon. It's great. I love cartoons. Yeah. I, I, I think you need that level. Of, there's a level of immersion necessary for this story that I don't think live action studio films really do for the most Mm -hmm. part and so i think that's another reason why it should stay an animated project Um, i agree i do think that tonally like and content wise like i do think a pg-13 like in terms of actual content because like there is action and adventure you know again think lord of the rings think like the planet of the apes movies in terms of like the complexity of the conflict like and even you look at something like some of the more like the crazier animated movies coming out nowadays, they're PG, but like some of that content does push the limits of what a PG is. Yeah. And I think a PG 13 on a movie like this kind of is lets you know of like, Hey, someone can die and that death is real. Oh yeah. Like if it's a PG movie, you're like, everyone's going to be fine. Yeah. Even, uh, except even for like... maybe one old person or the dog. But other than that. Yeah. Other than the character that is clearly established to be the most likely to die in a PG film. I I think we have an opportunity to just like, let's tell a story, let's make it ours, and let's go on an adventure. Yeah, a classic adventure. And and again, I really want to emphasize the idea of like, there are crazy ideas in this world, and I think they should all be taken seriously. I don't want to see like another studio movie that's constantly like winking to the camera about isn't this ridiculous it's like yeah but like let me get into it you know like the same way that like you hear james gunn talk about comic book characters and it's like yes this is a ridiculous idea but i want to take it as seriously as i possibly can because like that's what makes these stories good Mm -hmm. and endearing and 
I think for many reasons, the original film doesn't do that. It doesn't even take the general idea seriously. It's all background fodder for just whatever he wanted to put on the screen. And for better and for worse, by God, Ralph Bakshi did that. Yeah. So we're millions of years in the future. Humanity has evolved into all sorts of different kinds of life. Like the the Homo sapien gene spe- species, that's what I was looking for, has split into several other different kinds. There's fairies, there's uh, gnomes, there's frog mutants, all sorts of different kinds of people. And mm. I think a lot of them should be living together as and not separated by species because this movie very much does the thing of attractive equals good, ugly equals bad. Oh, absolutely. And I think we can just have a bunch of different people living together and those exact same sort of people are the people being drawn in by the charismatic cult leader on the other side oh yeah absolutely and that's that's one of the big things for me too is is just bouncing off of that black wolf i think has the potential to be a terribly fascinating villain you know like someone who is almost like seen as like he thinks differently right yeah and as a kid, maybe he just, he's a little aggressive. He's a little, like, violent in the way that, like, maybe a child with, like, temper issues would be, right? Right. But he's a good kid, and he hates to see injustice. He hates to see violence. He feels like, despite the fact that magic has taken the land once more, there is still conflict and hatred in a way that a lot of people don't deserve. And he sees maybe technology as, like, a means to an end. And so basically, like, I, I want to see him grow up and basically have this, like, the departure, the growth into, like, a, a corrupted evil villain just because he wanted to do the right thing in a way that maybe some people disagree with it. And now he's taken things too far. And let's also say, like, hey, we have this amazing, wonderful life, but it's also static. Don't we feel like they, we still have to work really hard? We still have to grow crops. We still have to do all these different things. Wouldn't it be great if we could have technology and like figure things out that would make our lives better? Mm-hmm. And he's shunned and shut down for that because people are like, look, we know our history. We know millions of years ago, the humanity of old le- leaned too hard into technology and it killed them all. And we were lucky to survive on this planet at all. But Black Wolf's like, no, we can still make things. We can still, like, create and try to innovate and be creative. And we can make life easier. Which, on the surface, sounds like something that would be really easy to draw people in with. Because, obviously, I'd love my life to be easier. That sounds amazing. It's the sort of thing a charismatic leader might say to to bring mm-hmm. people over to his side. Yeah. Someone who, again, is is kind and and warm-hearted and, like, draws you in with that. But then over time, like, that hatred and that anger starts to really seethe in and, like, put a person beyond the point. Like, to the point of no return, right? Yeah. Like, I almost think of this in a way of, like, someone like, like Killmonger. Kinda. Where it's like, not to that extent, because I think that one is a little more grounded in reality than something like this, like what his mission is. But the idea of like, at the end of that movie, like T'Challa does learn like, okay, he had some points. He just went about it the wrong way. I think Black Wolf has that same potential of like, yes, like we could repeat the same mistakes, but like we know better now and we have magic and we can use these things in tandem together to create the utopian world that, like, the last attempt at humanity never got to or never wanted to. I think our movie should start sight unseen with this a battle between someone piloting a giant robot and just a guy, or in my case, a woman. And mm. we have these two people facing off, and it's a not a very long battle, maybe a minute, maybe two, of just, like, the giant robot throwing fists, throwing fists, trying to, like, take out this lone person— And then the lone person, Avatar, does some sort of magic and plants and flowers grow up through the robot and break and and stop it from working. Mm -hmm. And Black Wolf does exactly what you said at the beginning of it. You haven't seen the last of me until next time and runs off. And then we get our opening voiceover of it's millions of years in the future. Mm. Forces of good, forces of evil, whatever. Black Wolf tried over and over again to force people to listen 
to his side, his, his beliefs, forcing them never worked. So over the last 20, 30, 50 years, he hasn't been forcing them. He's just been, te- he's just been telling it like it is. Yeah. He's, he's just, he's just been trying to, to convince people with words. And then yeah. we get back to like the land that Avatar and the, all of the, the magical nature folks live in. And there's still this robot, this giant uh, destroyed robot with flowers. And it's basically been grown into a giant tree. So like a Mm -hmm. tree has grown out of this robot, but it's a reminder of the dangers of runaway technology. Yeah, I I could almost see that like, like you could have it to where it's like, maybe it's you hear the narrator, right? And then it kind of like zooms out and it's like, oh, it's a story being told in the village, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, this is the legend of Avatar, our great and heroic leader, right? Like this is exactly, exactly how it happened. Like it did not happen any differently. Nothing (laughs) like, nope, this is it foreshadowing right sure. um and then like you you know you sort of pan out you see the village like it's seemingly perfect idyllic lovely right from there we can meet avatar like eleanor who is actually going to have some agency in this story you know <laughs> a woman with agency <laughs> you know i i think she i think you know looking at eleanor well real quick after we establish the village i think it'd be really fun if like before we cut to the title, right? We like we cut we see the village, everything's perfect. Hard cut to like a creaky vault door opening, like right? And then you see like it's like rain, lightning, thunderstorm, classic, iconic, right? Black Wolf steps in from out of the shadows, the lightning illuminates him, and he's like, I finally found it. The first of many. And it's like you could like it's like a vault and you could zoom out and it's like maybe somewhere in like post apocalyptic mm-hmm. DC or something. And it's like you can keep the idea of, like, the nuclear arsenal and weaponry, weaponry and all this stuff. And, like, you don't need the Nazi propaganda. Just say, like, the leftover weapons from World War Three. he's begun collecting them and, like, up, like arming his armies. And, like, boom. The, his plan can begin. Cut to titles. Like, okay, this is what's going to disturb the idyllic village's peace, right? Yeah. It also can be just... It also can be very much of like that we pull from the original movie of like, hey, I've gone back and I've discovered something the humans invented, a piece of technology. Do you think you have the power to control it? I can control anything. I'm Black Wolf. And the thing that he found is a gun. Yeah, that's perfect. Like, and like, I think there's something really, really awesome about the idea of like, and, and poetic about like, this is the first of many, like, this is only the beginning of, like, what we can do, you know, to, like, unify the world once more, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. hear, like, the words he's saying, and, like, in theory, like, the words he's saying, it's like, okay, he just wants to, like, unify everyone together and bring peace, and then he holds it up, and it's a gun, and you're like, oh, oh, oh no. no, how do we yeah. know this, pe- how do we know this technology from the ancient land of humans millions of years ago is even functional, it even works, he's like, you're right. All science requires testing. Bang. <laughs> Boom. And that would actually be fun, too, because that could almost be like a subversive reference to the ending of the original. Kind of. Like yeah. From the Easter. Yeah. But then, you know, it we looks like it that. works to me. Yeah, exactly. Like, it works fine. Like, get them shipped back to, to, to the city. Like, we must begin immediately. And then we go back to the village and Eleanor, I want to establish like. I think the idea of her being half fairy, interesting, like she's being like trained by Avatar to like harn, harness her abilities. And, you know, because she was kind of raised by Avatar in like a surrogate father way, like she's stubborn, right? Just like Avatar is like, could be stubborn about, we must like keep tradition, the old ways. She's stubborn about like questioning everything. Like, well, why is it this way? Why can't it be better? You know? Love it. Amazing. All of the, yeah, perfect. And yeah, also, exactly. do you want to make the, especially because I gender swapped Avatar. I don't know if you did. Um, we could make Eleanor her daughter. We can just like make it a like leader princess relationship. You know what? I think I actually like that more. I had actually kept the president in my notes, but I'm like, oh, wait, I no. still, I still have president, but it's occurring okay. to me now that because I gender swapped Avatar, it could be president and Avatar made a baby. 
Arik. Yeah, that's perfect. Like half human, half like, yeah, half, half magic, like half magical creature. Yeah, and it could be like yeah, that dynamic of like mother knows best, like not mm-hmm. in the tangled way, but just in the sense of like strict but still sweet and it's like everything she does she does for eleanor right to like for her well-being and her to the point where maybe like maybe down the line she starts doing things that we find questionable in the name of 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 justice and order you know and it's like ah, Mm -hmm. you know but we can get we'll get there and so meanwhile black wolf is like we have this new technology and we know that avatar is going to come up with a way to defeat the technology but not if avatar ever finds out about it and so they've moved on from just guns to sniper rifles or or shotguns or whatever and he tells Mm -hmm. this assassin robot i need you to go take out avatar because in because if avatar does only finds out about this thing when it's killing him then he won't be able to stop it yeah and And, so um... assassin robot gets sent off Wee Hawk tries to stop it, fails. The robot comes back and does, in fact, kill President. But Avatar survives and now all of a sudden knows about the technology and knows that this is going to be dangerous to everyone on the front line. This isn't just uh, a skirmish anymore. Now this is a war. Right. And I, I do want to establish something here. This is something I feel like they don't really talk about in the original I feel like my first thought when hearing like, okay, wizards versus guns, wizard wins, because like shield spell, right? But I think it's important to establish the idea that like magic was developed, like the idea of harnessing magic, like casting spells and reciting incantations was done in a time before guns. Like Mm -hmm. this is a thing, a threat that magic has never had to deal with. And, like, they, it kind they, of was rest- magic users are resting on their laurels, so this takes them by surprise. Yeah. Like, oh, no, guns are still real. I thought we got rid of those centuries ago. And, like, we never we never prepared for the, like, the kind of magic that would be needed to, like, deflect that kind of thing. So, like, it's there the is Buffy an episode, actual- right? Like, nothing that man has ever created can defeat me. And then Buffy says, yeah, it's been 400 years. I think we've come up with something. And then it's like a like a, it, like a a bazooka or something takes out the demon. Yeah, yeah. Like, something like that where it's like, it's just that's never something they had to, to learn how to use their magic to defend against. So right. that's the threat. That's why there are stakes for magic users versus guns and missiles and nukes and all this stuff. Something that the movie never explains in the original. They're just like, oh, guns are back. Oh, shit. Oh, dang. Okay, we gotta right, go. Well, okay. Yeah. Might as well, since we're here. <sighs> All right. I think we can still make the reservation. Yeah, that. which that's the whole tone of that movie. It's like, oh, fine. If, you know, while we're here, we might as well just do this. Go on this quest. <laughs> this movie is like, no, there are stakes. People die, including the president, Eleanor's father, and, you know, you can have that, like, classic moment of, like, Eleanor holding her father and, like, father's like, remember me. Ah, like, keep order to get alive. Blah, blah. You know, he dies. Or, like, maybe she she gets into the room, like, and he's already dead and Avatar's already taken out the robot. Maybe she doesn't get any final words with her father. Have it be, like, an actual dramatic, harrowing moment of, like, oh... So now she's on like a mission of revenge. Yeah. You know, which, which I thought we were going to be getting in the original movie, but they were just like, oh yeah, I had a dad once. Yeah, huh. that's it. And um, in that movie too, like he's never taken seriously. Like if I remember, he's wearing he a kind clown of, mask and he kind of has like a, not a Paul Lynn voice, but like, he sounds kind of like the Mad Hatter where it's very like, oh, I'm the president. Yeah. yeah. Th- yes. Correct. We're going to take this one seriously and actually have him, like, maybe be, like, kind of a leader to his people, which is, like, maybe when he dies, like, they have to do their best not to descend into chaos. Yes. So now we have this character, this robot character named Peace, who used to have a different name, but lost to time. And I also gender swapped the representation or the voice of Peace, which I don't know if we'll stick with that name. But basically, peace is now this blending of the, the the mechanizations, but now kind of being enchanted and piloted by magic. 
So if anything and anyone in this movie represents the fact that you can have both, it should be this character of peace because Mm -hmm. they are very much technology powered by magic. Right. And like you can have his like, you know, maybe initially you can play it up for comedic effect where it's like, it is lovely to meet you. I will destroy you. Like, and it's like, like him trying to like have to keep himself in check. And like his art could be over time learning to better handle himself like, and... like one from the first season of Infinity Train. Yeah, exactly. Where it's and... literally two halves of a sphere robot and one of them's like, all right, I guess we're going to do this. And the other one's like, maybe we'll all die. Yeah. And then you can have it like the end of the movie is like, you know, maybe we get to a point where it's like, we think all is lost. And then suddenly, like, finally, the unification happens. Those two halves of his person become one. And like, he is fully in control of himself. And it's like a powerful moment and like you know like maybe you could even have like a fun maybe like a terminator 2 thing where it's like avatar keeps having to put him in check like stop killing people pacify do not kill like we have to be better than this and he's like sorry i just it's so great you know and it's like (laughs) he has to like reconcile that part of himself that was like a, a, like a, an assassin, you know? Well, I also like it because like, we've been living in the shadows of this annihilated humanity for millions of years. And finally, at long last, we have something that's a step forward into something new that they never had that we've created. Okay. We no longer have to live in stasis. We figured out what the next step for sentient life on this planet is going to be. It's this blending of these different ideas together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the giant robot tree in the middle of town. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, that's perfect. Because it's like, in a way, peace can become like the new symbol. And like the robot represents the old ways of like, magic always has to win in the end. Like technology is dangerous. Whereas peace represents like the new era moving forward. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Yeah. They go off on their adventure. They They encounter other magical creatures and also bad guys that are coming to kill them standard adventure stuff is there anything in particular that we need to highlight within the realm of those stories like do we need to have them captured by pixies what do we need so i guess going into that i did try to incorporate that idea of like the land of the fairies and the pixies and all that stuff and i do have an additional element that i think could be interesting you know like great tell me so to kind of go into the fairies and um, stuff, I would I change it to it's more of like a council of more pure magic users because like sure. pixies and elves living together, right? And the idea yeah, is that yeah. it's like, we're just going to keep ourselves separate. Like we don't want to deal with like the, the scuttles of humans, you know, like classic stuff, right? And the idea is that they go to them initially to be like, there's a war coming. We need your help, right? And I've kind of added a twist in here to tie things in a little more. So Weehawk, right? First of all, we're keeping Weehawk. 100% we're keeping Weehawk. I have a whole pitch for Weehawk. Yeah, exactly. I I mean, if we, if you, can we get into that? We'll get Is into that... that in a minute. But not, oh, okay, not for okay. casting. I meant for like character beats. Character, yeah, character stuff, character stuff. Yeah, I'm not talking casting, just in character wise. Like he's still the head of the guard, right? Sure. I want him to be serious, like actually taken seriously, like a Legolas kind of character, or like an Aragorn, like complete professional, knows his weapons, knows his skill, maybe a little levity, can actually smile. Because I feel like in that original movie, Weehawk is just like, I'm looking to fight the whole time. Very Klingon of him. Here, I want him to be more about like honor and loyalty. Yeah. I, yes. So I think honor and loyalty in the like creation of the character but i also want it to be the the parodied a little bit of to to the nth degree of like i'm super serious about everything i do but also the movie starts with him failing and so i think we have a lot of opportunities for jokes and like obviously like he's gonna feel better and he's gonna end up having to save someone's life later and like okay i am finally redeemed um but like more so i think we get to have the fun of anytime they almost are like potentially maybe in danger or anytime like something bad is happening. We Hawk should absolutely tackle avatar, get them out of the way, drag them away as avatars like, no, get me out of here. I'm an old, I'm old, but I can fight. Yeah. yeah, Like let me at him. Let me. Yeah. And cause we Hawk is theoretically just like, just is bereft with guilt at like not doing the job he was assigned to do and failing. Mm -hmm. And so to the point where going too far in the other direction of like, Oh, 
a, a whole area got burned down because you tackled Avatar and Avatar wasn't able to prevent this fire from happening. Oh, no more guilt. Ah! Not again. Yeah. Oh, God. We yeah. Hawk can't do anything right. I, I love that idea because like going off that, it's like, what if Aragorn just got really self-conscious and like neurotic? <laughs> Yeah. And was just like having this crisis of self-confidence. I love, that's great. I love, I that. love, I love the blending of neurotic and stoic because I don't know how I've ever, how we've not seen it before. Cause I, I can't oh, yes. think of someone who's like that. Especially in like a high fantasy story, even though like the Dungeons and Dragons movie recently, like there's never been a character like that who went through that kind of specific arc. Even a movie like that, that was a little funnier and like a little. Yeah. Sillier. There was a super stoic character and he was super funny. But he wasn't funny in that because he was neurotic. He was funny just because, like, he j- was, like, the most direct. I don't remember the name of the black actor. Uh, who yeah, was, yeah. Like, um, the, the I know you're whatever. talking about. The guy from Bridgerton. Yeah, the Bridgerton dude. Yeah, yeah. And and Michelle yeah, and Rodriguez he's... was also super stoic, but also super funny. Yeah. So, so Weehawk, to, to kind of go back, I added a little twist here in that he's actually the brother of the ruler of the elves. Do you remember in Wizards, there's a scene where they go to an elf general? Yes. For like five seconds, and the elf general's like, all these weapons could be useful. Like, use the technology against them. And Avatar's like, no, screw you. You're stupid. Bye. Like, you're stinky. Yeah. And then they just leave. I have it to where, instead of the king of the fairies and the king of the elves, combine those into one character. And they're basically trying to recruit them and say like, hey, I know we've had our issues, but like, we really need to get serious about this. And I want that um, the ruler of the the fairies and elves to be the sister of Weehawk, so there can be some tension there, Great. and like she could also instill some of that like self doubt in him, like oh like you think you're so skilled, you left us behind to fend for ourselves, like I had to step up, like really great of you, and he's like oh sh-, you know, and they can be they can be running into them and. Like the, our our team can be like, hey, so you know how like you're about to defend this entire forest. I need you all to leave. I we we're not there yet. They have this these guns, this technology. You're all gonna die. So mm. we'd rather you stay alive. So please abandon this area of your land because we haven't succeeded yet. And so obviously right. this army is gonna be like, no. And like, no, you don't understand. You're going to lose. We've never lost ever. This is different. It's really not. Attack. No. Ah. And so now it's like yeah. they're on a they're on a time crunch of like they gotta get to the they gotta get to the guy and stop the thing. Right. That can be the first true example of like just the amount of damage that this can really do. And I liked the idea too of like that that ruler, the queen of the the fairies and elves in this little kingdom here, looking over like just the destruction that Black Wolf has left behind eventually, right? And then we can include that elf general arc of like she starts to buy into maybe there is something to this technology like to defend ourselves from black wolf and avatar's like no you're just you're buying into the same thing that he's yeah, doing yeah. just for a different reason but like 100 percent. yeah and so that's just going off of the pixies and stuff that was a thought i had was like to make them more like interesting and actually add more of a personal connection to like our merry troop of of adventurers you know <laughs> yeah exactly yeah okay so all those different things happen we make it to uh black wolf town mm-hmm. i'm sorry it's pretty big at this point so uh, uh uh the city of black wolf i do i do love the idea that he's become so egotistical that like the city has to be named after himself yeah it's like an avatar could have a line about like lazy bastard like couldn't even come up with a, a good town name yes just name it after himself what uh. like an arrogant like dunderhead you know like that'd be funny avatar I, I i brought the 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 avatar's big book of magic for us to learn from yeah 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 yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> sorry that took me a second like just naming something after yourself hey avatar here's avatar's big book of awesome magic made by avatar oh yeah yeah we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later <laughs> and then we hawk could lean over and be like uh, like i don't know like make a joke about him being a hypocrite or something i could be like shut up like kind of smack him on the side i'll give uh, you such an avataring <laughs> <laughs> exactly i love that and that that kind of goes into i guess another side tangent is thematically like i do like that idea of like 
that's a that's a funny joke, but I do think it speaks to the larger issue of like Avatar never heard his brother out. His brother, who like will come to realize, maybe did have some valid points about using technology combined with magic. Not so much in the sense of like guns and stuff, but like like you had mentioned to help with farming and crops and building houses and establishing communities. Like there's a lot of potential there, and Avatar never listened to him. So in a weird way, like. Avatar kind of pushed Black Wolf a little bit further just down that path of of just dictatorship. Well, we also are now in Black Wolf City, so we can see some of those ideas working. We can see yeah. transport. We can see trains. We can see greenhouses. All these different things that are theoretically separate from nature, but are in fact making life easier. Like the idea of, oh my God, they've got these moving vehicles. If we'd had one of these from whatever fantasy land we'd had all the way here, we wouldn't have had to walk for two weeks. Yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. Or like, you know, it's like we've been having an issue like getting sourcing water because there's no like body of water near our, our town. And then you could establish like the city of Black Wolf like has irrigation and like yeah. plumbing. And it's like all of these things that like and like this could be a moment for Eleanor too of like my dad lied to me about what technology is. Mm-hmm. like what did he what else has he lied to me about you know and like we could start to build those seeds of dissent of like hey dad or like hey mom like sorry i keep forgetting we've gender swapped avatar yeah but yeah. like hey mom like you didn't tell me it could do this and then she could be like well I, I didn't i didn't know that i think you did and then maybe we could learn more about like like avatars keeping secrets from Eleanor and like avatar maybe snaps at Eleanor and says like everything I do is for your own good. And then maybe Eleanor sneak Eleanor sneaks off one night and like finds Black Wolf and be like, Hey, I'm your niece. And like, you think he's going to be like scary and menacing and like, mm. but then he gives her a big old hug and it's like, Oh my God, I have a niece. Yeah. Like this is incredible. And, and Eleanor's like, what is going on? And then we start to get Black Wolf's perspective of, like, maybe he's really, like, cordial. It's like, oh, would you like something? Like, you came all the way here. Like, do you want some tea or something? And then, like, maybe we learn the reality of the story of what really happened. Like, maybe Black Wolf didn't use that robot that you had described in the beginning. Maybe he hid behind it. And Avatar's just like, bam, no, no, no. And, like, the moment where all those, like, plants uprooted the robot and, like, destroyed it. Like, that's a really powerful spell. Maybe, at, like, Black Wolf has this moment of, like, oh, my God, my brother could have killed me if that had hit me. Yeah. That would have, and, like, this dramatic moment of, like, my brother is gone. Like, it is only this person in front of me left. And then, like, we see, like, oh, now we see how the paths diverged, right? And then from that point, like, Eleanor could maybe fully be on Black Wolf's side. And then Black Wolf could say something like, cool, so you'll help me with, like, the guns and stuff? <laughs> and Eleanor's like, um, wait, wait, wait. You said a lot of good ideas. Then you said that one. Oh no! Exactly. Like, okay, now I get why he's a threat. He's going too far. He's beyond saving. Like, incorrigible at this point. Like, no. Like, I'm gonna take the weapons and I'm gonna force this on everyone and like become like a dictatorship. But a dictatorship with great indoor plumbing. Well, it's you like know. I like I appreciate the fact that you all want to live that way. My way is better, so we will only be living my way. Exactly. Like, and so pe- that's people what, and- pe- people shouldn't get a choice. If people choose, then they'll just stick to what's familiar, the only thing they know. If we force this on them, they'll they'll learn and appreciate that my way is better. Yeah. They'll come to realize that I was right. Like yes. and in that way Black Wolf and Avatar really are peas in a pod. You know, yeah. Like, well, my way is the best way, and anyone else can get scr- like can get bent. You know, a hundred percent. Good. So at that point, that's like when Eleanor's like, "Okay, I see the threat now." Reluctantly goes back to her mother Avatar and is like, "Okay, I'm not happy with you. I'm still upset with you, but like now I see why we're here. Like, let's go try and take care of this." You know. Yes. And so we can have this like I almost see it as like this three way battle or like a two way battle, right? You have the, we find out that maybe the ruler of the elves and fairies has been amassing her own army using the weapons that they have stolen from Black Wolf and is trying to storm the gate while Avatar, Peace, 
Eleanor and Weehawk are like fighting Black Wolf. And that could be our grand finale. We could see peace finally come together and unify. We can have Eleanor, like the classic, like finally master her training training and like harness magic and maybe even be more powerful than Avatar, right? And like, you know, like come together. Everything comes out perfectly. They defeat Black Wolf. Black Wolf, like maybe, I think Black Wolf should die. I like, think Black Wolf tragic, needs to die. Yep. Yeah. And in that moment, like, maybe he says one thing to Eleanor that's like... Well, I think Black Wolf should die saving Eleanor. That's good. That's good. And I like the idea, too, of Black Wolf having a moment of, like, maybe in death he starts to realize, like, I don't know how else to say this, so I'm just going to quote George Lucas. Uh, uh, I may have gone too far in a few places. <laughs> you know? And, like, maybe have that realization of, like, like, or, like, say something to Eleanor, like, all I ever wanted was like utopia yeah. or something like that right and then eleanor all i like, ever wanted was everything yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> is that so much to ask <laughs> and then maybe avatar's like perfect now eleanor with your magic put everything back to the way it was and eleanor's like no like now that i've finally in control of my magic like i'm gonna start taking ideas from black wolf and like create the perfect society using the best of both worlds and then maybe eleanor and avatar that's like the, you know how like the act four, so to speak, like the post climax battle of like Avatar versus Eleanor. And it's like Avatar, like you need to listen to me. Like you can't do this. You've gone too far. And Eleanor's like, no, I know like finally like full circle, like come into herself. Like I know what is best for our people. Like we need to give them the freedom of choice. Like we need to allow magic and technology to coexist and... And that's when like... that's when the other elves attack, and it's like, okay, all of the there are still people who live here, and th their leader is gone, but they don't deserve to die now. The war's already over. We don't need to just go in and and, and butcher them all. We have yeah. to find a symbol, something that will get them all to stop fighting and listen to me. And that's when peace comes in, because peace, this robot who's been enchanted with this magic, who's a blending of the two, says, "Use me." And Eleanor knows what that means and realizes what that is. Peace is going to sacrifice himself. And Eleanor uses her magic to create this gigantic tree, much larger than the tree that Avatar made at the beginning that was, the that was taking over the robot because the robot's willingly sacrificing itself. And it is this single tree that's huge and is a blending of the magic and the technology all coming together into the single thing in the middle of Black Wolf City, City of Black Wolf, Mm. And it's like, oh, shit. That's even better than the one that we have. Yes, how did you do, like how that. did you do that? And then Eleanor says, let me show you. That's uh, that's perfect. I that's I love that. That's so good. That is the perfect way to do it, because then you get the, the big sacrifice, the the thematic connection to the beginning of like, this is the symbol of a new society. And then Eleanor finally gets the moment to like be the leader. She's always you know, like been destined to be. Yeah. And yeah, then, yeah. yeah. And then the ending is perfectly. We see like, I don't think, and this is just a general thing in movies. I don't love, I don't love the hard cut to like, okay, we figured it out. And like, we're at where we're supposed to be. I like the idea of seeing like, maybe it's like a month or two later. And it's like, Eleanor is out there giving supplies to other towns, to people who need it. Right. And I think it should be this thing of like, we're not fully there yet. And there's going to be some people who disagree with us, some people that don't want this. That's okay. But we need to spread the word, right? And like, so the ending could be Eleanor and her team, like basically going out there and trying to spread these resources and give people the happiness they truly deserve. Yeah, it's the, we will give you this technology, do with it what you will. We will int we will give you the designs of how you can have infrastructure, trains, irrigation, all these different things. I'm gonna we're gonna give them not just to the leaders, but to everyone who lives in the communities. So that if anyone just wants it for their farm, they can do that. And if you choose to do it for the whole town, that works as well. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna and we're gonna show up on bicycles because it didn't take us two weeks to walk here. Yeah, exactly. I. I just like the idea of like, no, it's still, it's not a hundred percent. They're still, but they're, they're trying and it's, it's the movement has begun in yeah. earnest. And then I do like the idea of like, maybe we see in the beginning, there's a family, right? Mm -hmm. 
that lives in that village that like and we see maybe like a little day in the life kind of thing of like they're farming they're you know like taking care of a baby and like cooking and cleaning and all this stuff right Maybe we see them and now they're like moving to Black Wolf over like voiceover from the narrator, voiceover from Eleanor, right? And we see them living in Black Wolf and they do that same day again, but now it's it's so much better now. It's so much easier. And then we zoom out from like the window of the, the, the home they live in and then that final shot, we just pan up to the tree, you know? Mm-hmm. And, we pan, and we pan up and we see that unity once again and it like shimmers a little bit, right? And maybe Eleanor, the narrator, could say something like something about how, like, maybe Black Wolf wasn't so so wrong after all. And maybe Avatar wasn't so right after all. But like something like that, well, you know, now now instead of having Eleanor narrate that we have Avatar sitting there telling the story and Avatar says maybe Black Wolf wasn't so wrong and Avatar wasn't so right. And we hear that and we find out that Avatar is the one saying it. And then that's the end of the movie. I like that's perfect. Yeah, cool. I think that's great wizards so. wizards boom have a have a have like ended on a pop single from i don't know people these days sabrina carpenter or something obviously ed sheeran <laughs> everyone loves putting ed sheeran in their fantasy uh, epics oh yeah oh jeez. <laughs> but yeah there we go no yeah. here we go here we go we have uh, ed sheeran do a cover of weird science by oingo boingo because in the lyrics <laughs> he says magic and technology yeah boom there we go that's it solved (gasps) wizards give them a million dollars boom there we go perfect all right hell yeah let's get to cast oh yeah let's do it let's we gotta start with avatar Mm Mm-hmm. so i told you that i gender swapped avatar but i don't know if you did i did not and in fact for uh for avatar as well as a lot of my casting i'm very curious to hear what you have because i am if I'm being honest, I think I'm far more excited for the possibilities of we you have going. So in the movie as it exists, it's not stated this way, but it's what I leaned into because it's clearly what they are. Avatar is chaotic good and Black Wolf is lawful evil. And I feel like those are kind of the worlds that we're living in. And so I very much for Avatar wanted to lean into a woman who could just very much be chaotic good and you just see her and you go yeah that's your vibe and like because that's who she well that's not who she was in parks and rec but that is kind of who she was in a sort of other things but that that's kind of the character that she was in will and grace and i recently saw dicks the musical (laughs) okay this took me a second okay i think i know who you're putting down because i think the perfect person for what our version of avatar should be is Megan Mullally. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I, I, I could see that. I just love the idea of like Tammy, Tammy two as Dumbledore. <laughs> yes. That, that is exactly what we got going on right now. <laughs> oh jeez. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Cause that's so, who, that's who Avatar is, right? Like super chaotic. Like I'm going to throw out the weird lines and be silly and you can't stop me. I'm Avatar. And yeah, now yeah, it's time. very much. And so. now it's time to be serious. And, but yeah, but then it's like when things get serious, it's like. So for my for my avatar, because I I did not gender swap uh, avatar. I went for kind of the more obvious choice, but there's more to a reason of there's more of a reason to it than you think. Uh, I went Jeff Bridges. Sure. And I think that's a, a very obvious choice because of like again we've been describing him as like. In the beginning, before things get more dramatic, he's very, like, Uncle Iroh, Big Lebowski. Like, yeah, it's jovial, true. bit of a goofball, but, like, power deep within. But the big thing to me is I'm thinking more of Tron Legacy. And okay. And Tron Legacy, I, I have a soft spot for that movie. It's not perfect, but I have a soft spot for it. And I feel like the dichotomy of Flynn, played by Jeff Bridges, and Clue, played by Jeff Bridges... Like, Jeff Bridges can do that. Like, I can imagine near the end that scene where Avatar's trying to put Eleanor down and be like, like, what have you, like, yeah, you know, like they're yelling at each other. I imagine him in that scene, if it were him, going full clue. Like, shouting, screaming, like, full power, like, you've betrayed me, kind of, like, that dramatic intensity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, him going full uh, uh, Iron Man 1, whatever that character's name was. Oh, Obadiah Stane. Obadiah Stane, yeah. Just oh going from 
uh, freaking freaking Big Lebowski to Obadiah Stane in one role. Yeah, going full. Uh, Tony Stark built this in a cave with a box of scraps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Again, that's that's, that's I mean, the that's easy good. choice. But yeah. yeah, I I do like Megan Mullally though, because <laughs> I do feel like just thinking about Tammy too. Like when she wants to be threatening, like she does give that energy, like that piercing gaze of like, oh, you will kill me and my whole family yes. if I cross you. <laughs> I could, I, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I could see that. It's like because remember, this is. A 3,000-year-old, one of the two most powerful people on the planet. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Tammy, too. <laughs> yeah, Tammy, too. Oh, my God. Uh, that brings me to Eleanor. Who did you have for Eleanor? So, Eleanor, this was a harder one, too. I feel like you needed someone who could do the two halves of, like, someone who's maybe a little, like, someone who's stubborn and, like, a little sillier. Maybe she's a little reckless, like, likes to live a little dangerously sometimes. It gets in trouble with Avatar. And then can kind of transition to that more serious role. This is someone who I feel has a potential for that and has never gotten the opportunity to play a role like that until now, of course. Isabella Merced. Oh, okay, sure. She's she's an actress. I'm going to like list the things she's been in and it's going to be like, oh, she was in Madam Web. She was in the <laughs> live action Dora movie. She was in the Mark Wahlberg comedy Instant Family and she's playing Hawk Girl in James Gunn's Superman movie. And I feel like I can see, like, leading actor, like, potential in a lot of her performances in movies that I don't think are quite up to snuff. But I think she could play that role really well. I think that's fair. I think that's good casting. I wanted someone who could be very serious, but then immediately that kind of, like, falls apart when she realizes she doesn't have all the information that she thought she had. And I think that that was very funny when she was in Cruella. And I think that that was very funny when she was in The Good Place. And she's also in Barry and Killing Eve, but I haven't seen those. And so I went with Kirby Howell Baptiste. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's also, um, if I if I remember correctly, she's Death in the Sandman series, right? Oh, maybe. I don't yeah, remember. I, I didn't I, watch it. No, I, I love her. She's great. I could totally see her doing that, playing that role really yeah, well, too. But, like, but it's also, I think there's a five to 10 year age difference between Isabella Merced and Kirby Howell Baptiste. I don't know that that's true, mm. but like Isabella Merced was Dora. So like, I think of her as being younger. So I guess the real question is, do we want to go younger? Or do we want to go older? Cause I could be drawn to going younger. I think both of them have their potential. I think if it's, if you go younger then like, yeah, of course she's in that age where she's very like, I'm un- I'm unstoppable. Like nothing can take me down kind of energy in the beginning. You know, sure. and then have that kind of go away and have it be a coming of age story, right? Yeah, I think that's about. Yeah, I mean, Isabella Merced is 23. Kirby Howell Baptiste is 37. Let's go younger. Why not? All Let's right. go with Isabella Merced. All right. So let me tell you about my Wee Hawk. All right. Because this particular character was Native American coded, I kind of felt obligated that I was like, this is a character that should be Native American and should be played by someone who is lives in and is comfortable in that space. So I, I cast one of the leads from Reservation Dogs, an actor named uh, D. Farrow Wunatai. Did you cast the same person? I almost did. I almost oh, did. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> and I, I just think it'd be fun. Like, Reservation Dogs is fundamentally a comedy, but it's also a comedy where, like, it's the characters can are stoic and silly. So a little bit of both. I thought he'd be fun. Who did you have? So I picked someone who I think can play... Sort of, again, because the the start of it, like, very stoic, very, like, noble, honored, like, warrior, like, um, but I think can do it with, like, confidence and insecurity and, like, maybe Mm. be a little sillier. Um, uh, He made a great turn in Rebel Ridge on Netflix. So for my Wee Hawk, I picked Aaron Pierce, who played the lead role in Rebel Ridge. He was really great in that movie, really, like, portrays an air of confidence and knows action, can do action. But at the same time, like, I feel like there's points in that movie where, like, he... he... Are you saying Aaron Pierce or Aaron Pierre? I think I I meant Aaron Pierre and Google Docs. Aaron Pierre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my bad. Um, But yeah, no, he's fantastic. I think he can be jovial when he wants to be. He can be overly confident when he wants to be. I think he can be insecure and nervous when he wants to be. And I think he can be an absolute badass in all the right moments. That guy, 
I think as total star, like that movie showed me that he's a star in the making. And I think a role like this would be really good for him. Yeah. That's not unreasonable. How do you, he he's not Native American. No, in fact, I I I, no, I also think he's British. Yeah, I actually want to go with yours just because that was my like. I came down to like three actors, and your cho- it was between your choice, Aaron <laughs> Pierre, and then a third person. Let's go with De Ferro Wunatai then. I think that's absolutely. Fun. This is going to be the weird one. I didn't know what I was going to do with this, and then I I ended up settling on who I had. Who did you have for the robot assassin? piece so i this one was tougher too because the person i picked for black wolf i actually thought could also do peace but we'll get there the person i ended up picking peace is a comedian by the name of james a caster a caster a caster yes he was recently james a caster is great casting for this role he is hilarious i think he can portray like the rage the the rage within him and the like the more action scenes really well i think he can be like that dry wit and like neuroticism of like someone at conflict in their head i think he'd be perfect for the part i think james at acaster is an amazing choice i think he's incredibly dry but also like very very funny and also incredibly socially conscious and would be like oh make making a good message and like sticking it to a bunch of like rich assholes who don't know better love that <laughs> exactly i think that's re- i think that's really good oh man that that's i love james a caster the person that i had i i went for dry delivery with an element of like i don't know if you're making a dig at my expense i can't tell that's how dry you're being right now <laughs> yeah it's like i i can't tell like what is this tone you're doing like are you being serious or are you just mocking me yeah uh, so I first saw this actress in Scrubs, like one of the later seasons. She's very funny, but she's very dry. She also is apparently one of the voices on American Dad every once in a while. But her two really big breakouts were Happy Endings and Future Man. This actress is Eliza Coop. Okay. I, the second you said Happy Endings and Future Man, I was like, yeah, I could see that. Especially because yeah. I, I always think of her, she's in one episode of Community. Where she plays like a secret service agent for, yeah, what is it? Is at, and I forget who is like visiting Greendale and like her and Abed have like a romantic fling. And she uh-huh. does that really well where like everything she says is the most dramatic, intense, serious thing you've ever heard. But like yes. it's her being like, I think you're cute. And like, like being like lovey dovey. I think, she, yeah, that's a really good casting choice too. I mean, that's it. I love James A. Caster. I think James A. Caster is awesome and hilarious. Ah, man, both of them would be so good. You know what would be really funny? I think it would be really funny because we talked about them going back and forth between, like, the good version and the bad version of Peace and, like, the conflict between them. I think both voices should be in the robot. I could totally see that. But I I do love that, the the dichotomy. And then when they unify, then it's like both voices talk simultaneously. That'd be fun. That'd be fun. So the question then is, who is Necron and who is Peace? That's a good question. And... I think obviously the British person is evil. <laughs> I was going to actually say the opposite. I could totally imagine Eliza Coop being like having that like, like the idea of like going into a rage room and just smashing stuff and getting way too into it. Like, great. I, I could it. see her having that energy. And then I could see James A. Caster being like very like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, I can't. Oh, no. Oh, no. Like, yeah. Okay, great. I love that. Either way, and then they like go back and forth and you're not sure what's going on at any point. I think that's great. Yeah, I love that. That brings... So the other two I had are Black Wolf and King President. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about Black Wolf. My Black Wolf, this is someone who I know just as a voice actor. And I wanted a little bit of that because I always think for if you're doing an animated movie, don't just cast celebrities, cast voice actors. And this guy is great. The two things I'm going to cite is specifically the way we're doing Black Wolf right now. He is the voice of Amon from season one of Legend of Korra. He's also the voice of Spike in Cowboy Bebop. Okay. His name is Steve Blum. Steve Blum. Classic. I could see. Yeah, that's that's good. Especially like I could see that commanding voice for Black Wolf. And at the end of the day, Black Wolf has to be smooth as silk. We have yeah. to, he, he has to be charismatic and we have to believe we're willing to follow him wherever. Oh, yeah. Dang, that's, ooh, okay. So <laughs> my Black Wolf, I, I did go with a celebrity route. Of course, you didn't know not to. Yeah, so this is someone who I think 
is really good at playing weird little freaks, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think he is someone who deserves a starring performance. I think he deserves what I'm going to call his split moment because he is a British actor. <laughs> the idea of like having someone, because like James McAvoy in Split, like that, I don't really like that movie, but I think his performance is solid of just like the, the range and the different like actors he plays, like the, the calm, like the charismatic, the calm, like loving energy of the, like the, that auntie character and like the pure rage and like the death in his eyes. I think this actor deserves that moment with Black Wolf of someone who, and if you've seen him in movies like The Guest, you know that he can do both like the charismatic, like every man who like everyone in town loves and the terrifying, like if you even make eye contact with him, you're dead energy. And that's Dan Stevens. Oh, I don't, I'm not entirely certain who that is. You'll see him and you'll be like, Oh, I know him. He's been in so-and-so he's, he's been in a lot of studio movies and smaller roles. I think he was also the beast in the live action beauty and the beast. He was in this year alone. Yeah. He's also in Downton Abbey. Oh yeah. But in this year alone, he was in Abigail and Godzilla X Kong. The the was it the New Empires? The second one. Yeah, I I just saw that a couple weeks ago. Who was he in that movie? He was the guy. I think he was like the doctor, who like is like in the Hawaiian shirt. Oh, Him. yeah. He was very funny. He is someone who I think like I could totally imagine that moment of like you like Eleanor approaches him and like. He looms over her, those piercing blue eyes gazing down at her, and then goes in for a hug and goes, I have a niece, oh my god, like, amazing! And then immediately, like, at the end, by the end of that scene, turns it into, like, if you're not with me, then that, like, then, you know, the, the Anakin line of, yeah, if yeah. you're not with me, you're my enemy. Like, I think he can make that turn perfectly. And I think this would be his yeah. moment to finally be like, he's always been, like, smaller roles in bigger movies, and I think this would be his opportunity to play that a character like that really well. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's valid. I, once again, don't know who to go with. Tell me who you had for King President. So King President, I had in a smaller role. I think this is, I did go for a voice actor with this one. Oh, like, interesting. Sort of okay. voice actor. He kind of dabbles in both worlds, um, but he's most more voice acting as of late. I think he's someone who has the commanding presence of a leader and... I think would play this role really perfectly and also have that like love and warmth in his voice. I have Keith David. You're not going to fucking believe this. No. I I, like, you were like, he dabbles in both worlds. I was like, please go where I think you're going. Please go where I think you're going. Do you have Keith David? hundred percent. I have Keith David written on my piece of paper (laughs) right fucking here. (laughs) Oh, that's too good. Oh, I love that. Well, obviously, Keith David, for sure. That's amazing. Oh, I that love when is, that happens so much. That is perfect. I love that. I Hell yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I think he's someone who, like, he could be the leader of a small town and, like, still be charming and funny. And then when he dies, like, the, like if he were to have dramatic, like, final words for Eleanor, I think he'd, like, he'd play that role perfectly. Yeah, excellent. Love it. And then we can go with Dan Stevens for Black Wolf. That's very funny. All right. Uh, um, um, cool that's that's great i love that did you have any other like actor roles or do we go into writer director now yeah for actor roles i did if we were to keep sean the head of the, the <laughs> okay so if we were to keep sean the the take i had we never went into this i had him as a fairy liaison who's the head of magic for avatar in the village sure and so i had him played by an actor by uh, by the name of i know i'm gonna totally botch this rahul kohli Co- um, oh yeah rahul kohli from uh, i zombie Yes, and he was also, I've seen him a lot in, um, he was in Bly Manor, and I think at one point he was, people were championing him to play Mr. Fantastic, which would have been amazing. That would have been amazing. I think he would be great for that because he's very charismatic and charming, and when he wants to be, and he, like, especially in Bly Manor, I think he's very, he has a certain level of care and concern that I think is amazing. I fully support Rahul Kohli. The ruler of the fairies and elves. I cast someone, now this is the person who's kind of like a combination of the Elf King and the Elf General, the one who like ends up using technology to storm the front gates at the end. This is an actress who, she's been in a lot of small bit parts. She was on Mandalorian, she was in Ant-Man and the Wasp, but her big role this year came in the movie Love's Lies Bleeding. Uh Uh-huh. I think she could have that sort of like, I imagine this leader as someone who like is all about honor, 
loyalty also, but like takes it too far. Like some like a certain like certain types of Klingons in Star Trek where it's like that is all that matters. Nothing else matters. Even if it's like you're doing the wrong thing as a means to an end for that, that's all that matters. Sure. And it's Katie O'Brien. Yeah, got it. I thought that's who you were talking about. I think she has a commanding presence in both like a, a royal way and in a way of like take no man prisoner, like kill them all kind of energy that yeah. um, that I think would be good for that ending scene. Okay, dope. Yeah, I'm into it. That sounds great. Yeah, and I think in terms of yeah, in terms of what we talked about, that's all I have casting wise. Cool. Then let's talk about writer. You just gave me a couple uh, casting roles, so let me tell you about my writer first. Let's do it. For both my writer and director, I have separate. Both of them have done animation because we're doing it. We talked about this ahead of time. We're doing an animated movie. Yep. And I was like, I think it's important that we do people who can handle animation. And so this is a writer who has had an interesting couple of years. Like she was a writer on Ralph Breaks the Internet. And while also doing My Year of Dicks. And she's also the right one of the writers, I guess, behind Nimona. Okay. And I went with uh, a writer named Pamela Ribbon. Ribbon? R-I-B-O-N. Pamela Ribbon. Okay. Gotcha. And I just was like, Nim- especially because of Nimona in particular. And because like yeah, I don't sense. necessarily want this written by dudes. Um, but like... Directed by dudes is fine, but like like a little <laughs> bit of like <laughs> like I I want the Nimona energy of just like it's a it's a fantasy world they live in it they understand it because Nimona also is a blend of magic and technology, yeah, in an interesting and fun way which I didn't know that's where we were gonna go but it worked out great that worked out perfectly yeah <laughs> and I don't know and Ralph breaks the internet is fun yeah okay I'm happy yeah. but I'm happy to hear who you have. So for mine, I picked people who are kind of well-rounded in a lot of ways, and in a way that I did not anticipate was going to work out the way it did, but it did. So I actually have two writers because they're a team. How many Spider-Mans have they written? None. Oh, I okay. Actually, now I, I'm even more I, interested. I avoided all Spider-Verse affiliations, <laughs> sort of. It'll make sense. Sure. So these writers, they actually just won an Emmy recently uh, for their oh. work creating the show Blue Eye Samurai. Oh, okay. And, and I think uh, Amber Noizumi, I hope I said that right, and Michael Green would be perfect for this. Because if you look at that show, I think that show is incredibly dramatic and takes itself very seriously. It's It has levity in all the ways it needs to without feeling overbearing or ruining the, the stakes of the series. And if you look at Michael Green, too, um, he's been a writer for a long time. His stuff is so varied from things like Blade Runner 2049 and Logan to like the Dwayne uh, Johnson, the Rock Jungle Cruise movie, you know, like this is a guy, this is a guy who has kind of dipped his foot in both of those ponds. And I think specifically his work with Amber Noizumi on Blue Eye Samurai proves that like they could totally do a, uh, a film like this. Hell yeah. Fully into that. I've already written their names down. I think that's incredible. I fully, yes, absolutely. All right. Then who did you have as your director? So director, uh, I did say no Spider-Verse affiliations. I guess I kind of lied. Uh, this is a person who has worked with Sony Pictures Animation. In fact, I would say that his work on the Hotel Transylvania movies kind of became the foundation of that, the foundation of that studio moving forward. And I think if you look at his history... In terms of the series he's created and worked on, from the sillier stuff like Dexter's Laboratory to this more stylish stuff like Samurai Jack, I think, again, the versatility. And I think someone, he, I believe that he is someone who also has an appreciation for the history of animation. So I can imagine him being someone who would hear this pitch and hear about this idea of remaking this movie and go... Oh my God, that'd be per- like, and then start talking to you about scenes like on the spot, like I can imagine this going there and like this happening and you could do this and this and like still capturing some of that energy while also being like an actual movie. And that's uh, Gennady Tarkovsky. Plus we just heard him speak at a, at a rally for animation a couple months yeah, ago. Exactly. That was fun. And, and I think on top of it too, I think part of it going into the rally, part of it is uh, justice for his movie that Warner Brothers canned. And I think also, too, this is a movie that, it, again, it's 20th century, right? So mm-hmm. these days would be under Disney's jurisdiction. I think a move project like this would be Disney's opportunity to kind of 
have that sort of animation that could compete with a Sony Pictures project like Spider-Verse. And I think to get the guy that like helped kind of start that studio and its philosophies and techniques is a perfect move. Yeah, I mean, he's had a varied and a varied and diverse filmography like samurai jack alone is enough of a reason to potentially give him a shot on this movie he he's worked on so many different things i i was not a fan of his uh most recent thing i didn't particularly like unicorn warriors eternal that one was that one was definitely a long shot i think it had some interesting ideas but it didn't quite stick the landing yeah so it's like i would i think working with him with oversight, with restrictions, with rules, because I think he, if left to his own devices, will kind of like go down a big uh, philosophical path. And maybe that's not where we want to go. Oh yeah. That's, um, that's fair. But, he, but he is like, if you're looking for someone to kind of like capture the elements that we're going for, he is perfect. He is kind of the idea of what you want of technology, bad, getting in touch with nature, high action just like as an action director alone he's amazing oh yeah like i guess tangentially going into the last episode you did his like watching his reel for the popeye animated movie he was going to do that never came to be like the perfect balance of like comedy slapstick and action in that reel i didn't alone. realize that was him i watched so that episode went out today and in the dueling genre discord scott corelli posted that I didn't know that was Jendi Tartakovsky. That's crazy. Yep, that was, it was his, so good. That was his supposed to be his thing of like, okay, I did the Hotel Transylvania movies. Will you let me do this? And then Sony initially said yes. And then went, um, just kidding. Do Transylvania 3. And he was like, fine. So, uh, but yeah, no, I think that reel alone on top of his work on Samurai Jack and even some of the projects he's tried to do with Sony, like on top of that R-rated comedy that got... I guess, you know, to keep in line with what that movie's about, neutered. He was also going to do, like, this super stylish R-rated action movie about the Black Knight in, like, a medieval fantasy film. And it was going to be super stylish, lots of harsh shadows, like, full sword and sorcery, like, violence and blood, and, like, apparently that's still on the way, I guess. So I feel like he's got that dichotomy down, more or less. Well, I mean, as long as we're... thinking about action let me tell you about who i had for my director because i think action's important and i think you need to have fun and interesting and compelling ideas of two completely different fight styles like clashing with each other and i think that happens a lot in kung fu panda i think it happens a lot in rise of the guardians and really having someone who just wants to take all the magic out of the world is a really big part of Puss in Boots' The Last Wish, <laughs> which is a movie that it has, is so much better than it has any right to be. Oh, absolutely. I went with a director named Joel Crawford, wow, who directed okay. all those movies. Yeah, yeah. That's... He is very much a big DreamWorks uh, director, mm-hmm. clearly, based on all the things I just said. Oh, yeah. But Puss in Boots' The Last Wish is so fucking good. I, I don't know, like, I think the fact that that movie is is so fucking good is um, is in and of itself a miracle, because it's a, it's a sequel to a fine original movie. And I know there are people who prefer it, and that's fine, and I support you. Um, I happen to disagree. I didn't necessarily like the first Puss in Boots movie, but I love this one. Oh, yeah. No, that, that movie came out of nowhere. Yeah, and... It was my choice for best animated movie last year. And there are some insane animated movies last year. The the Spider-Verse movie came out last year. Mm -hmm. Plus like three other things that were awesome and I can't think of right now. I feel like we talked about Jendi Tartakovsky for so long that we kind of have to go with Jendi Tartakovsky. But like, Joel Crawford also good. No, no, no. I I think that I absolutely agree. I think... I think one thing that he definitely has above someone like Jendi Jendi Tartakovsky is I think the emotional moments, like the moments where we're supposed to have the serious dramatic heft. I don't know if Gennady could do that as well, because I think Gennady could do the the sprawling world really well, could do the action and the comedy really well, but like thinking about it, like the panic attack, like that whole arc with death alone, yeah. I think to me, like that's the stuff you need to nail the most. Because if you don't even yeah. get that, then like the whole movie falls apart, because why do you care? So, like, it's that true. is, there is an interesting, like, I'm not sure. It's one of the best villains I've ever seen, period. Like, when we get to the end, he's like, no, you don't understand. I'm not a metaphor. I am literally death. And it's like, 
Oh, fuck. And it's so good. Oh, yeah. And it's, I love the, the, the just frustration at the arrogance of like, you have dodged me more than anyone else. And like, no one, no one can get out of my grasp. Like, even you. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, then we'll go with Joel Crawford. Yeah, awesome. Let's do it. Let me take you through our cast for Wizards. Avatar is going to be played by Megan Mullally. Eleanor will be Isabella Merced. Weehawk will be D. Farrell Wunatai. Peace will be Eliza Coop and James A. Caster fighting for control of this <laughs> poor, fragile frame. Black Wolf will be Dan Stevens. King President will be Keith David. Sean, King of the Fairies, will be Rahul Coley. The Fairy Elf high ruler area will be Katie O'Brien. All of this will be written by Amber Noizumi and Michael Green, and then directed by Joel Crawford. That is Wizards. You gonna go see this movie? Oh, absolutely, in a heartbeat. Hell yeah. But yeah, that's that's it. That's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for, well, no thank you for making me watch this movie, but thank you for remaking <laughs> this movie for, with I, me. I am sorry for the both of us for watching this movie. Seriously, for anyone listening to this who's like, maybe I'll give it a, I'll ch- a chance to check it out. Don't. This is like, do not, do not go see this remake when it comes out. Yeah. Our remake is great. The worst part about our remake is that it might encourage people to watch the original. Oh yeah. It's this, oh, this, (laughs) I'm sorry for that, but thank you so much for having me on. This was incredibly Uh, fun. So now's the time. Do plugs. Talk about social medias, projects, other things you want people to listen or watch. Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on Instagram or YouTube as Kino Tripper. I do plan on, I, I've made content before. I, I'm trying to go back. So keep an eye on my YouTube channel, especially. I'm going to start making video essays and shorts, kind of use that as an outlet for my creativity again. Other than that, yeah, that's really it. Cool. So Instagram and YouTube, those are the ones. Kino Tripper. Can yes. you spell that just in case? Sure. It's K-I-N-O-T-R-I-P-P-E-R. Hell yeah. I had to resist the urge to laugh when I said pee-pee. I apologize. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, If anyone is interested in following me, I am on Instagram at Ideal Remake, spelled just like the name of this podcast. Or you can find me on Blue Sky, where I am at Sam Gash, S-A-M-G-A-S-C-H. And yeah, we've reached the end of the episode. So, uh, Jake, I will end this episode the same way I end every episode, and I'm so nervous about this. What is your favorite quote from the movie wizards i i think i gotta go with the first line in the whole movie an illuminating history bearing on the everlasting struggle for world supremacy fought between the powers of technology and magic 